Here we go. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day on this wonderful rainy day. Do we need the rain? Well, we're going to start getting it, so. <laughs> Let's pray and we'll do this. So, Father, as we talk, be honored. Thank you for our mothers. Uh, thank you uh, for the role they played. That sounds kind of silly. Uh, think of our children and your faithfulness in their lives. That you work along family lines. And so, I think, uh, as, a, as mothers, I think that the prayer is that, that you know, our, our, their children will come to know Jesus if they don't already know them. Um, so move in our hearts uh, that we might appreciate the grace of God more, understand it's not performance-based other than the performance of Jesus, and he did pretty well. And so we stand clean and perfect and accepted and loved. We cannot disappoint you. Uh, there's nothing we can do to turn that relationship away. You never look at us and shake your head. All that was paid for on the cross. So as we work through mere Christianity and we're moving on to this part about Jesus, uh, may this resonate with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's just review again like we did last week, and, and then we'll jump ahead. Remember what we said. He starts with this awareness of white, right and wrong. And that at least gets you to think that there's probably something out there. Now, I told you there are, there are people that totally disagree with what he says. That doesn't matter. It, it, if it helps you think through a concept, uh, it's, it's helpful. Remember, this, this, is, this is not the end all. It's just... Part of the process is we're working through theology. We're always on part of the process. We never get there. It's always trying to find analogies and pictures that work. And so he uses right and wrong. And he, and he says from that that this God is good because we like good better than we like bad. There's got to be some sort of pattern for this goodness that someone or something. Uh, but we're not good. This is number three. I'm just working through those real quickly and then we'll jump to where we are. But we're not good. So he says... If there's something out there and, our, and our, our moral code tends to lead us in that direction, then we're probably in trouble because we're, standing, we're, we're in a wrong relationship with, with whatever it is that this thing is. Um, and then he looks at the, theistic or not atheistic worldviews and says the only one that really works is Christianity. If you would compare other worldviews, they don't really work. Uh, I, I told you Francis Schaeffer used to say, if you can find a worldview that explains the world better than Christianity, go for it. But you can't. And so he says atheism doesn't work. Um, pantheism doesn't work. Dualism doesn't work. We work through all those. And just a, a deism that says everything is okay doesn't work, because it's not. He said it's only Christianity then that, that, that is a grown-up understanding of the world, in which you look at the world and you say, it, it's really good, but something's gone really bad. Um, there's a dark power, number seven that is operative. There's evil in this world, and we live in a world that has lots of evil. The world itself, there's, it, it, you can tell the pattern is good, uh, because even the evil is bouncing off of the good. Remember his whole argument, you've got to have good in order for there to be evil. And that, that, that evil is really a, it, it's a false attempt to get to good. And then finally, nine, Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, Jesus, uh, landed in disguise, that is, he came not in glory but in humility, and he's calling us to take part in this campaign of sabotage. It's really taking over the universe uh, that Jesus has come. So now he's beginning to talk about this Jesus, and he asked the question that we looked at last week, is he Lord, liar, or lunatic? And he said, it, 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 again, this isn't a perfect argument, but it gets you to think, was, was Jesus crazy? If he's crazy, you can, you can take what he says and just ignore it. But it doesn't seem he was crazy. What he said wasn't crazy. What he did wasn't crazy. Was he a liar? Possible. A lot of liars out there in the name of religion. Uh, was Jesus one? Well, there's no record that anybody considered him a liar. And the one thing we talked about last week that proved, that seemed to show that he wasn't his liar, is, is he, it was a pretty good, pretty good call to say, I'm going to die and come back from the, from the dead. That's a, that's a pretty, you know, that's a, Pretty reliable. And so he probably wasn't a liar. And so then, then Lewis ends with this on page two. Now it seems to me obvious, halfway through was Jesus God. Now it seems to me obvious that he was neither a lunatic nor a fiend. And consequently, however strange or terrifying or unlikely it may seem, I have to accept the view that he was and is God. Remember, he's talking to people who 
uh, are not necessarily Christians. And he's using natural revelation, this, this inward God consciousness, outward creation itself. He's not using scripture, even though he dabbles in scripture, because the only way you know about Jesus is really through scripture. So he's mixing them, but he's really trying to focus on natural revelation. And the world would have been different because even non-Christians would have known the story of Jesus in the world that he was talking about. And so he is saying, if you just look at the facts and, and, and don't even use the Bible, uh, there's a pretty good chance that this guy's much more than you think he is. And so where he leaves you is you've got to make some decisions. It's, it's your call. Not, and, we, and we say underneath all that, there's a God who's working. But from a human standpoint, you've got some decisions to make. Then he jumps into Christianity and says, and here's what Christianity is really about. It's not about character change, really. It's not about going to church, really. It's about the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's what matters. Uh, this is the main thing about Christianity. Then he talks about these theories. Um, and and we, we're working through these theories. And here his theory on page three. Lewis's theory. He talks about theories of what Jesus did. And remember what he says is they're just theories. You're trying to describe something unimaginable in, in words. And you're always at... Um, a loss for words. And so you use all these different pictures. And so the Narnia books are an attempt to explain this. They revolve around the death of Aslan. And once he resurrects, having been killed, now he can begin to march to the country and take over. Um, and so all of this theory is simply this. This is B. We were let off because Christ had volunteered to bear a punishment instead of us. Remember what he said? We, we had a debt. And the debt was that we, we believed we were God. We, we were a law unto ourselves. Uh, and that we, we, because of that, became rebels. And he then says, number three, and so what needed to happen is we simply surrendered. We realized that we'd been on the wrong track. We needed to repent, which he describes as unlearning all the self-conceit and self-will that we've been training ourselves into for thousands of years. But here's the problem. Only good people can repent. Therefore, we need to repent, but we can't because we're sinners. And the person who could repent doesn't need to repent because they're already good. So now jump to page four. We're almost all the way we got through. Look at it. We got through it in eight minutes. If you guys would have been quiet last week, we could have left early. I said we were glad Mary wasn't here last week because we'd still be talking. So he ends that by saying the same badness which makes us need repentance makes us unable to repent. You see the problem? So, so when you present someone with the gospel and you tell them here's what you need to do, understand they can't do it. You can't convince somebody into the kingdom. It's a work of God. That's why we say that, that, that really God has to change their hearts before they can repent. So you actually became a Christian before you even knew it. And then you repented. So you didn't ask Jesus into your heart and then Jesus moved, Jesus moved, and then you asked him into your heart. You, you, I think that's such an important distinction. And so when you begin to see people and they begin to move towards repentance, there, there's an awareness of their rebellion that you haven't seen before. You say, ooh, the lion is marching. Aslan is marching. He's doing his thing. And so that's what you're looking for. So how did God navigate this problem? Well, he put into us a bit of himself. Um, and we looked at Brown's thing where he says, we take the first step. By the time we get to the second step, we realize it was God who took the first step. God moves. It's not us. There's nothing we do. So if you ever go somewhere and they do a, an altar call and they make it incredibly emotively manipulative, people might go up and, and their hearts might be changed. That just happens to be coincidental that the Spirit of God is working. It's not because of that. It, 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 you know, you can do that, but but my concern, we try not to do anything like that with our high schoolers because when, when they're tired, we can, we, can, we can manipulate them. And then they say, I've come to know Jesus, but all they've done is stood up and said this. And, and the, the coming to know Jesus is a much fuller thing. Uh, so he puts a little bit of his love in us, uh, is what he sa does. And now we're going to pick up from there and talk about repentance. Questions or comments? Yes. Bob is at work raising his left hand because he still has his right hand sheathed. Yes, sir. Um, as, I re as you read more of this, and I've, I've read it before, and um, this is what came to my mind. Let's see, Brown says, 
He's having a pregnant pause. Right. He's talking about methods of witnessing and, and, and in light of the fact in light of the fact that, it, that it's really God who does it, you then can ask questions rather than make statements. Yeah. I, yeah, I think you do. Have you ever considered? Because if the Spirit is working, he's saying, have you ever considered that Jesus might be? And then he goes on talking about Bob. And, and, and if the Spirit is working, yes, they have considered it because God's moving in their hearts. Yes. And you'll notice Jesus, I, I, again, as I'm working through John, um, um, you, you, Jesus generally doesn't look at someone and say, you know, you've you got to choose Jesus or go to hell. What he does is he addresses them where they are in their life and says, here's the answer, and, and the answer really has to do with me. Have you ever considered? See, that's a good way to put it. Have you ever considered? Because if they don't consider it, that's not your responsibility. And if they have considered it, you get to be part of the answer. Yeah, there you go. He's saying some of the EE training has this sort of idea of asking questions. Well, that's what you want to do. All you want to do is start the conversation because you're not starting. It's already been started. And who knows who they talked to yesterday at Publix and who they're going to talk to tomorrow. And so it's less of a program and more, more of a lifestyle. And, and Paul says to Timothy, always be prepared. And, and he talks about, you know, the hope that you have. And so as God moves in hearts, he's going to bring people your way. And you don't expect it. And all of a sudden, there you are standing in Walmart talking to someone about you know, the, the, the comfort of Jesus. Divine appointments. divine appointments. They're all divine appointments. Every appointment is divine. <laughs> Pilar! We were talking about her this morning. I have not gone back to see Pilar. Wouldn't you love it if one morning she came in here? Yeah. Pilar, get on camera. <laughs> this is Pilar. Yes, ma'am. Oh, go ahead. I will. I'm going to tell her she's going straight to hell. Is it God's call, John? Is it's Joanne talking. It is God's call. Is Paul? Is, is, is God to blame then? Is, if, if you're children, if you're, no, God's not to blame. We're to blame because it's our rebellion. We are sinners uh, and we sin. So we are guilty by our nature and by our actions. We are responsible for our choices. You, you, you got that? So us and our children. Here's, why we, here, here's where we claim the promise of God. That he, if someone in the family, you, comes to know Christ, then it seems to be that it spreads through the family. Not always. But you don't know what God's doing. Even if you don't get a response externally, that doesn't mean God's not working. But your part is prayer. It's painful, isn't it? I'm, I see the pain in your eyes. Um, because it's Mother's Day and these are your children. She's, gonna be with, she's got five and with three of them today. And so you pray that God moves and you keep talking. But, but don't be surprised if they come to you and talk. And I think it would be a good idea if all of us made it one of our prayer requests that we keep moving in on God. We talked about Brown. He prayed for his brother for how many years? See, Brown prayed for his brother who would make fun of his Christ, Steve's Christianity. And it wasn't until he was an older man, right before he died, that this guy became a Christian. So it's God's timing. God knows your heart. If you love those children, guess who loves them more? If you've mothered those children, guess who's mothered them more? Um, if you're concerned about their eternal destiny, guess who is more? And if he's put that pain in your heart, that's the pain he feels. But he knows, he knows what he's doing in Jesus. That doesn't, that doesn't give you a foolproof answer. But I think you bank on the compassion of Jesus. So it's, it's hard to look at you right now because I can feel, sort of feel the, feel the pain. So someday when it happens, I'll bring Pilar, you bring your children. And we'll, we'll rejoice together. 
And here's the woman who lied to me this morning because she told me she rode in on her boat and I believed her. I really did think she was Noah's wife, but go ahead. Yes, Mary. Correct. She says God's character and his demands never change. But, I feel like I'm at the UN. But, and the woman from Yugoslavia. But, but we can change his mind through prayer. You think? Yes. Mary says we can change God's mind through prayer. So he doesn't know what the future holds. It's all, it's all unfolding as you pray. And Heaven and forget you. Forget. If you sleep in, what's God going to do in the morning? He's going to say, oh, you know, I don't know what to do today. So Mary's saying her part is to pray every day. Now she's saying, here's what I'd say. Mary's saying she thinks she can change God's mind. I'm thankful we can't. But here's what I would say. Even as God puts together his plans, he includes your prayers in them. So, your pl- that, so that doesn't belittle your prayers at all. It, it includes your p- prayers, but they're effective because they're part of God's plan, not because they make God's plan. So then, they're, then, then I would say that they give me even more comfort because... As I pray for the, the, the salvation of my children, clearly in the mind of God that all people would be saved. I don't know the specifics. I don't know how he works. Uh, but, but, but with your boys, as they, as they grew up in a Christian home and they were in a good church uh, with people that actually loved them, they heard grace more than, I'd say, 98% of the churches in the world. They went to Westminster with its ups and its downs, but there were some good people there. Uh, they have heard about Jesus. And, and you can't, one thing about Jesus, once he's there, he's, you know, you, you just can't get away from him. Well, the irritating that's, neighbor. That's what really gives me a yeah. peace. Because I've been told, and I think it's true, that second generation Christians are the hardest ones to keep in the faith. Yeah. Like my children. But you don't have, she said second generations are the, hard, the hardest to keep in the faith. But you don't have to keep them in the faith. I'll tell you what. It's second generation, not Christians. It's second generation religion. So if you've gone to a church and you've never really seen Jesus or met Jesus, um, and, and, and you get a bunch of the rules instead, you run as fast as you can. But if, if, if a kid's grown up hearing about Jesus and grace, and your sons have, um, that's the one you can't quite get away from. I mean, I still fight against my, my legalistic upbringing. Right. And yet, I, I, I can't get away from Jesus, even though I've tried. So, so I'll be right God there. Well, that's not... Shirley's asking, what if God doesn't choose them? That's, that's not our call. Abraham, when, when God is looking over the edge at, at Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's going to destroy it, and he goes back and forth with, with God on bartering how many, you know, how many lives and... And finally, Abraham says, will not the God of all the earth, the judge of all the earth, do what is right? You trust the character of God. You, you trust, I think if God's put, I'll give you my, my heresy. I think if God's put a concern for your children in your hearts, that's an awfully good sign. I also think if God takes a child home early, uh, I don't know what happens but, 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 but I would like to think that somehow, you know, as they're still alive, because I don't think, you know, it's afterwards, that, that, that the Spirit was moving in some ways. Um, that, that's, to me, the only way I can have peace when I watch high school kids and younger die. And I don't know that, but I do trust the character of God that he does what is right. It's really not our fault. Well, it's not, we can't convince him. And the more you attempt to convince, and it becomes haranguing, like make your bed, make your bed, but accept Jesus, accept Jesus. Um, there is a part of us that is still rebellious and prideful that says, yeah, you used to be my mom who could make me do this. Not anymore. So, so you're hitting the key. Is, is, it really is, uh, I think, humbling ourselves before the Father and saying, Father, move. And use me, use others. Um, you know, humble us in such a way that they see Jesus in us. They see our pain, they see our love, our acceptance. 
We're not there to judge. That's not our job. Um, they've got everyone else judging them. So, Because really, without Jesus, what's the answer? And as kids get older and life gets messier, they're going to realize that. And they just, uh, I tell the kids, which of you, you know, I'll have a group of kids, and I'll say, how many of you are going to be divorced three times? <laughs> I said, somebody in here will be. And, and who in here is going to have an incredibly rebellious child? And who in here, you know, who... We would said this before Lucas d would die, and I'd say this in class. I, I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable now, but I'd say, guys, we assume I'll be the first to die. Who's going to be the second? You know, who, and, and who's going to totally just, just their lives are going to disintegrate? I said, it's going to get hard for some of you. Some of you will skate by. Others of you, you know, it, it's just going to be, and this is where, this is when this stuff helps. Um, so we're not trying to, we tell them all the time, we don't want you to be religious. We want you to know Jesus. And, and for each of you, it looks different. So, boy, this is serious stuff. I should have gone to confession last night. Yeah. You said, I don't believe that I'll change God's mind. Yes, Bob's questioning about changing God's mind. Maybe I'll change my mind. Well, the Old Testament, in fact, is where it was Well, I'll, I'll tell you one that you hear is uh, at the flood. You know, God repented that he had made humanity. So you'll hear that, well, God, would, God didn't realize what was coming. Here, here's the problem. If you can change God's mind, is he God? Is he really in charge? Can we trust any of his promises? If his promises, if God's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and he's made promises about eternity, you read Ephesians 1, that we're safe, that he calls us holy. It goes on and on and on. Well, if God's mind can change, then ultimately we don't know anything is secure because he could change his mind. Yeah, you can still have good character and change your mind. I was a good father, and yet there were times I changed my mind. And we'd say, well, we're going to the park today. And then the schedule changed. I said, oh, we can't go to the park. Oh, you're horrible. No, no, I really, I want what's best for you. I just changed my mind. So then you can't trust what I said all the time because I might change my mind, even if my character remains consistent. Yes, but. This is good. This is, a, yes, this is good theology. But you like that word. I won't sing my song. No, not at all. I'm, I'm wrapping it into the very character of God. If you do not start with a God who is all sovereign, who knows all things, then there's a corner of the universe that, he, that, that, that is a, a loose cannon. It's good. This is why Baptist churches have so many people that go to them, because this, this resonates. It sounds like, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to slam on Baptist churches. It sounds like we should be able to change the mind of God. But can you imagine if you're praying, so you're at a game and your son's playing, Brad's playing football, and you pray, dear God, may Brad have a wonderful game and may Westminster win, Westminster Christian School. And you're playing, you know, you're playing a, 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 a public school and we beat those pagans and we, in, such, in so doing, we are witnessing to them. And there are so many Christians on that, at that school and they're praying, dear God, my son is playing, may they beat Westminster Christian to show that even in the non-Christian world there are people who are worshiping God through sports. And so he's got these two competing ones. To whom does he listen? To Mary Crable, who's riding her boat? Or to somebody else who's at the other school? And God's there saying, I don't know what to do. So at halftime it's tied because he hasn't made up his mind yet. But, this is your third use of but, you are a Trinitarian. I'll give you the final answer. Your, your argument's going to fall apart. It, it, it can't ultimately work. Why? Because you, if God's not in charge of all things, he's not God. It doesn't mean he's not in charge of all things if, in fact, prayer, the power of prayer, okay. can change Let, his thinking on a subject, so i.e. The, the salvation of my children. So that means where God is leading the future is still unknown because... Excuse me, he could have changed, he could change his mind. He could say, oh, that's a better, so up to now, up to now, Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. But what in a thousand years, God says, you know, I got a better way of doing this. I'm going to do it differently. And all of a sudden, all of us who have accepted Jesus have been, oh, shoot. Whoa. Okay. So you better get on your knees and pray all day. What are you doing in Sunday school? Right. You need to be praying right now. Wait, 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 wait. So you, anything you do other than prayer is a waste of your time. Well, that's why this country's in such a mess. Oh, here we go. <laughs>
Well, so, you, so now, now, the, now God is responsive to you. You're not responsive to God. He's doing your bidding. You're not doing his bidding. Yes. You've made yourself God. Don't you try to confuse me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to make a statement about women, but I will. Watch it. Yeah, it's Mother's Day, so I'll save it for next week. And I'm thinking it. <laughs> yes, sir. We are not going to get through our notes again. <laughs> now we're talking about our country being a mess. I would agree. We do not pray. What does he say? He says he wishes you'd be quiet and not say anything else. <laughs> he, he's saying you're, he's in agreement with you about the state of our country because we do not pray. There, it's okay. And then under his breath, he said that other part. Okay, go. During the sermon. Somewhere in the Old Testament, I'm going to pull the Moses. God said, all right, I will do it. He had made up his mind to come. Sure. Sure. Yeah, but, but you've, got, you've got different things like that where, where God seems to be, but, but, but nowhere is it taught that God changes his mind. I would say what you've got is God presented in, in a way that humans understand. Because, it, it, I mean, we can, I, it, you throw out a couple of those, and those are always in narratives where God has taken on either human form or he is speaking to a human within some sort of discussion. So he's playing the role of a person, but he's still God. But when you describe his character, man, just look at how many hundreds of passages that say God, God does not change. And, and that's a good thing. Can you imagine if God decides that Mary Crable hasn't prayed quite enough and so he changes her mind about making you a Christian? No, no, no. Oh, no. Oh, I got her going. Shoot. It's like a wasp nest. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mr. Postman. I would say... Say what? What, did I say something? I didn't say anything. <laughs> this is Mary Crable, in case you don't know her. She used to be the lead singer for the Supremes. Yeah. The Supremes. Okay, let me think. Oh, watch. He said something. She's thinking. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, you could find ten or right, 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 and they barter. And they barter yeah, 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 one. yeah. But there are incidences all throughout the Bible where it says God relented. Not instances all throughout the Bible. You may yes, find, there are. Well, well, guess what, your assignment, if you don't lose your train of thought. Okay, next week. Is this, what, is this the look your kids got when they had bad grades? I will come. Look at that face. Ten incidences. Well, that's not it all over, ten. God all right. He had, he had thought one way and decided this is <laughs> This is excellent. Okay. Okay. Got and it. And then, da, 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 and he, it said, then it says, and God relented. Sounds good. And in some cases, it says he repented. Because we don't use repentance. It's a different use of the term, yeah. 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 Well, you find those, and we'll, can, we'll carry, know. we'll carry, this is excellent. This is a good conversation to have. I love it when Mary's wrong. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, he looked down after 400 years and he was concerned. Sure. Okay, he wasn't concerned 300 years. He wasn't concerned. He, in other words, it brings the question to mind. After a very long time, rebellious people, he looked down and he was concerned. Right. Okay, does that make you think he wasn't concerned before that? Oh, so Shirley's saying, you know, even how God's presented as who's concerned, but he wasn't, after 400 years, but he wasn't concerned before that. So, yeah. So I would say scripture is good at presenting him that way because that's how we can understand him. Uh, but I don't think character-wise, it's, 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 if you look at it theologically, it, I don't think it holds water. And that, that would be one of the main differences between a, like an independent or uh, a, a non-reformed church and a reformed church is really you start with the sovereignty of God uh, the question is, where do you start in theology? Do you start with the love of God? You have to start with God. Do you start with the love of God or do you start with the, power, the, the sovereignty of God? And um, I, I remember I was talking to a Methodist minister and I told him I thought I could be a Methodist minister. He said, no, you couldn't. I said, yeah, I could. And he said, well, where would you start? The love of God or the power of God, the, the sovereignty? And I'd say sovereignty. Because if he's not all sovereign and in charge of all things, his love doesn't matter because he's got no power. I'd rather, you know, but, but if there's no love, the power doesn't matter either. I mean... Yeah, yeah. Well, you can't really, but, but, but as a Reformed dude, I really do stop. I mean, I, I agree with you. They, they sort of do meld together. 
Uh, so it may be a, 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 fake, a fake dichotomy that you, need them, you really do need them both. But, but, but his love is dependent on his power. Um, uh, yeah, she's saying his power is dependent on his love. Well, the way he uses his power, his power in and of itself is not dependent on his love. He could be powerful without love. Well, that's Satan. Yeah, that would be, yeah, that would, that would be a scary process. But he could be that way. And so his, his love defines his power or how he uses his power. And that's where I think your prayers come in because it's, it's the love of God who, who uh, you know, I, I've told you before, is my, you know, you, you, your kids, um, as they ask you things, and, and you answer, but you answer according to what's better for them, not what, really what they ask. Even though th- th- there are times you give them what they're asking for, but, it, but what they're asking for really fits within the larger plan of what you have for them. So, I, I, and, I, and Mary said, God is not willy-nilly. You know, I, I think you pray, I, I, I read somewhere, as you look for those verses on repentance, there, there's a... Um, there's, there's a statement on prayer that I'll see if I can find about, you know, we pray as if, if all of what God does depends on what we say, and, and, and yet we understand all that we pray for is dependent on what God wants. Somehow they merge together. And that, that really is true. I think at some point theology loses its ability to define these things, and if we define them too much, we get, we get like this. Like, I would never dis- want to dissuade you from praying. Yeah. I've lived in Miami. I have fake knees and fake elbows, so it's nice to move them. Um, and, 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 you know, you don't, you don't want to, but you don't want to be manipulative with your prayers as if you get a, like I was with a bunch of preachers one time and they said, be careful how we pray because you know our prayers carry more weight. That was a scary statement to me. As a preacher. Yeah, because, you know, they're holier than the rest of us. Oh. That was the idea. Well, it was, a, it was ordina- uh, ordaining a young, a young guy and they included me. And it was a Saturday morning, so I was wearing jeans and sandals and they were all in suits. And I thought, whoops. And they all referred to each other as Reverend this and Reverend that. And they kept calling me Reverend Reed. And I kept looking for my father. I know he's here somewhere. And so it was all very formal. And they took, there was a hierarchy. You know, it was God and then them. They were the go-betweens between the people. And, and, and somehow priesthood of the believers got thrown out the window. And um, I, I would never want to get to the point where you think, you know, like people will call me and say, will you pray for me? And I'll laugh. I'll say, I'll pray. But, you know, God probably knows your name better. He knows mine. Um, I'll, join, I'll join you in prayer, but periodically mine come back and hit me in the face. Yeah, that's that's, that's yeah. the whole idea. If yeah. you're one or more gathered yeah. to pray, then there perhaps is more power in that prayer. Yeah. But just you pray for me, you have no more power in your prayer sure. than I do. And I think collectively, I think, again, but I would also say that as you pray, you ultimately pray what you do because God's even moving in your heart to move you towards prayer. So even that is God's gift. I think you have to just keep going back to God. And, um, yeah. The fact that God changes his treatment of us in response to our soul search has nothing to do with his prayer. Correct. Now, that, that's a different story. Yeah. I tell the high schoolers, if, 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 can your parents trust you? If they trust you, by this age, you shouldn't have a curfew, probably. You know, you, you, you don't ask them, may I go to? You say, I'm going to go to something. And so that even the terminology is changing. But if you've proven to be a kid who's not trustworthy... Then, then, then the way you talk to them is different. You will be home by, you know, you will let me know where you are. I may let you use the car. I mean, you know, so it's, uh, so our choices, if we run along, the, if, we, if we move the way that God's wired us, and it turns out to be obedience, they really come, it's really freedom. Yeah, no, no, his intent was to show his grace all along because the story's really about, you know, poor Jonah and, and, and how angry he is. This is good. You guys are theologians. This is fun. Are you saying that different denominations can argue over points that, I mean, like this? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. There, are, um, there are whole denominations are bit, many of them have different understandings. You, notice, there, there's never an altar call here. Why? Don't we love Jesus? Don't we want people to come to know Christ? Certainly. But, but there's, a, there's an understanding that, that um, it, the altar call is not really going to change your heart. It, it, and so it, that doesn't mean they're bad. 
But my fear would be you'd get on the side of you can convince somebody. Um, you know, if you tell them about hell enough, I don't want to go to hell. So of course I'm going to say I'm going to, you know, you say this certain prayer, then you're automatically in, and, and, and I question that. Because I think it's, it's like... It's like kids that, when I worked at a, a Methodist church and kids would get confirmed all at the same age and magically that week all became Christians. And I thought, well, that doesn't seem to be how God generally works. And as soon as they got confirmed, we'd no longer see them in church because now they're confirmed. It's like they had their life insurance policy. And uh, so different churches do it differently. You noticed at the key, there are never all, remember how we did communion even? It was, a, it was really a prayer and healing service. It was a, it was a different feel. Um, so, yeah, different denominations. Oh, and, and, and with communion, too, I can remember Steve saying, you really shouldn't take communion if you have unresolved issues sure. Sure. So, in your life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fencing the table. It's just a, it it's, has nothing to do with no. the denomination. No, no, that one. Well, but, but, but there are some that say that unless you are in a particular group of, of churches, you, you can't take communion. So there, there are different... Like, I couldn't take communion at a Catholic church. But that makes no sense. Well, they would say it does. Um, and, but, but a Catholic, boy, I, I, could a Catholic take communion here? If they truly believe yeah. it. That's uh, interesting. I'll, I'll ask Kent. Yo, answer well, me. As far as the Presbyterian church is concerned, yes. As far as the I mean, when I was a pastor, I, certainly I would say, if you know Christ, but I know, the, I know the, the language is a little bit more specific than either it was or than I understood that it was, even for a PCA church. Yeah, see, I, and I wouldn't do it simply because I'd feel like um, I, 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 even my understanding of communion would be different. Right. So I, I probably wouldn't do it just, just because. Most saints don't believe that you're actually right. in the blood. Right, so Bob's describing what happens at a, a, a mass, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a different understanding. The, the understanding is you take mass, you are re-crucifying Christ for your sins. And, and that's why if you're Catholic, your, your crucifix has the body on it and our crosses are empty. Because we, we really focus on the finished work of Christ. And they focus on the need for repentance in order to sort of jump into uh, Christ's work for you. Hey, all sorts of things. All right, let's keep going. Now, we, now we're, we're actually where we were going to start this week. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, this is fun, though. This is, this, this is how theology works. You learn theology just by talking. And uh, it's a dance, and that's a, it's a good way to go. Okay, so the character of God and repentance. So he talks about how the good person needs to re- can, is the only person who can repent. The bad person needs to repent, but they can't. So God puts a little bit of, of his love into us. So here we are on page four. Repentance is something which God cannot do. So God can't repent. Why? Because there's nothing for, of, for him to repent of. Uh, he cannot surrender to suffer, submit, die. Why? Because he's God. The one road for which we now need God's leadership, most of all, is a road God in his own nature has never walked. That's a great observation. So God can't do what we need. And then here comes Jesus. So imagine if our nature, he uses the word amalgamated with God's nature in one person, then that person could help us. That person could surrender his will and suffer and die. He was a man. And he could do it perfectly because he was God. So now page five. So we cannot share God's dying unless God dies. And he cannot die except by being a person, a man. And in that culture, certainly a man. I mean, theologically, it had to be a man. So the necessity of Jesus in order that our sins, could God simply have forgiven our sins? No. Why not? Can God do anything? So it's a setup question. The answer is no. Can God sin? He can't sin. God has limits according to his very own character. Can God simply forgive sins? No, his justice will not allow him. There always must be payment. And so when Jesus dies, so if my kid breaks something in the house when they were small, I could simply say, don't worry about it. I'll replace it. God can't do that. There always must be payment. Now that's good news. It's bad news at first, but good news at the end. When Jesus comes in and he dies, God gets complete payment. That's, what he, that's his theory. God gets complete payment. What's cool then is once God gets payment, the reason we're in a right relationship with God through Jesus is not because God overlooks our sin. It's because our sin's been paid for. 
There is no debt between us and God. You say, well, I'm, I'm guilty before God. You're not. Why? Because Jesus took that guilt. My sin not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross. So sometimes we still say, I'm a horrible person, I'm a horrible... You may have horrible attitude, but your sin's been paid for. And Ephesians 1 says, before the foundation of the earth, he called me holy and blameless. And so when we beat ourselves up over our sin, what do you do when you find yourself sinning? You take it to the cross. And, and rather than doing some sort of penance, you go to the cross and say, Father, I don't want to live this way, but thank you that I'm clean. It becomes a means then of rejoicing in the greatness of God in covering your sins. The goal is not that you feel bad so that you're shamed to behave, good behavior. The goal is that you celebrate your freedom and you walk according to who you are. So I was at a Bible study last night and somehow a poker game broke out. I'm not sure how that happened. And, and, and I, I, as a good Christian preacher's kid, you know, I don't know how to play poker. I had my little cheat sheet there. But after every hand, I'd tell myself, it's a new hand. It's a new hand. See if this time you can do anything other than fold. <laughs> and so every day as you sin, you take it to the cross. You say, it's a new day. It's a new day. Uh, who was I listening to? I was listening to my, my, my Sunday morning staple. It's a, a reggae station. I don't know. And, and, and they were talking about not living in the past. And I, as I was listening, I thought, that, that's the key. You can't live in the future. You can't live. This is what you got. And so when you've got it, you take it and you say, right now, uh, my relationship with you, Father, if there's, if there's anything in me that is keeping this relationship, I, I bring it to you. And that's where communion, I think, is helpful. Not, to, not so that you feel bad about yourself, but if you have unresolved stuff, that's when you simply right there say, Father, man, bring it to my... You've done that, right? Where God's like reminded you of stuff, and all of a sudden you thought, wait, 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 wait. I've never even thought about it. That's pretty horrific. I do that. Wait, I do, I do that. And, then, and that's God's gift, and he cleanses you, and you just take it to the cross. And communion happens to be a nice time when you can do that and say, I'm clean. And so in, 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 in taking the elements, you're celebrating the fact that the relationship is not hampered in any way. You realize God is pleased. Why? Because Jesus repented. Well, but we needed to. Yeah, but we can't. And so he did it for us. Addressing an objection. Is that where we're supposed to be? Let's see here. Yeah. Uh, if Jesus was God as well as man, then his sufferings and death lose all value because it must have been so easy for him. We can move beyond this. Uh, and what he basically says is, in one sense it was easier for him, but he doesn't say this, but on the other it was harder for Jesus because he died. There was a guy who was, who was um, put to death, I guess electric chair in 2017 uh, from a, for, for um, a crime he committed in 1989, I think. And, he, and the whole time in prison, he said, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. He's been dead for four years. They just found DNA that said he was innocent. Here's a man who suffered in prison for 20 years, and he was innocent. Imagine Jesus. As he dies on the cross, and he faces the wrath of God. I'm innocent. Father, if there be any other way, but not my will, yours be done. And so, he, and, and so the objection that it was easy for him loses, man, no. If anything, it was more difficult. So the practical conclusion, here we go. Let's, let's see if we can get through some of this here. Christ's perfect surrender and humiliation because, perfect because he was God, surrender and humiliation because he was man. You see the necessity? He's not 50-50, so page six here. He's not 50-50, it's 100%. He needs to be all man and all God. Uh, go back and read um, as Jesus deals with Nicodemus um, in, in early in John, and it's, it's just fascinating. He's trying to explain to him the necessity of being reborn. Um, and, and the necessity of Jesus then being the means of this happening. What's our share? Uh, now the Christian belief is that we somehow share the humility and suffering of Christ. If so, we shall share in his conquest for death uh, and find a new life after we have died and in it become perfect. He doesn't write like I would write. And perfectly happy creatures. So it's more than trying to follow his teaching. So the idea is that you don't become a Christian and now try to be good. Try to, you know, what would Jesus do? That, that's okay. It just has its limits. Rather, what has happened? Uh, Christ who died and rose, this is three, has given us a new life. And so a new kind of man, but person. And he's put it in us. We are new creatures. We are not who we were. We're not even who we were yesterday. We're new creatures. And the Spirit of God lives in us. Why? Because we have, we have joined in on the death of Jesus. We have suffered with him. And in so doing, we have laid down our arms. We have come to him and we've, we've given him the pride that we have, the rebellion that we have. And it's a constant daily thing. As you say, unresolved. It's a daily. 
Father, show me if there's anything. There is no pride. There is nothing anyone can say to you that, that really can offend us. Why? Because whatever they say, you know it's worse. The truth is worse. Uh, there's, not, there's no job that they can give you that's below you. Why? Because if Christ is willing to die, then here, and the character of Christ has become ours so that we are of all people. That's why I think the childlikeness is so cool. The laughter and the willingness. I, th I say, you, you tell what someone's like, how they respond to children and dogs. Is there, is there just this like, awareness that you're, and, and, and a joy for life? Why? Because, because I've been made into a new person. How is this to be done? Number five, it is God who arranges how the new kind of life, the Christ life, is to be spread. It's Christ who's working in us. So churches, we as people, ought to be the most attractive people in the world. On the one hand, they're repelled because they hate God in rebellion. On the other hand, we have what people need. They're drawn to us. Uh, I work with high school kids. High school kids seem to like me, and I don't know why. But, but I'd like to think, well, I'm, I'm older and I'm boring. I mean, I don't know. But, 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 but I, I'd like to think maybe it's something with Jesus. Would that work? Yeah. There's something there that they're attracted to. That's so cool because it's, it's the life that he puts in you. Three things spread the life of Christ. Then he gets to some funky stuff, and we'll see if we get to this. Baptism, belief, and then what he calls Holy Communion. So, uh, what's he say about how they work? These are means. He says what God's given us are some, some sort of tangible signs to, to help keep us in the fold. They're a means of healing and repairing. This is C. So, the baptism, the belief, this communion are, are God's gift to us to kind of keep us going. And you're going to get different, you're going to get different explanations. And, and when you get to communion, it's, it's fun to talk to people because everybody's a little squirrely when it comes to trying to describe it. Even the person who says they're not. It's a means to repent and pick himself up. This is page 7D. Over after each stumble. Because the Christ, life is inside of him. Now these are externals. You don't, you, you, you don't have to do, like you, if you don't get baptized, the world's not going to end. Uh, if, if you're in some churches, they say unless you're dunked, it doesn't count. Or unless you're baptized at our church, it doesn't count. Unless you're baptized by Protestants, it doesn't count. I think God's got a little bigger basket than that. And, and so I was baptized as an adult um, right before I took a job at Key Biscayne. I'd never been baptized. And Brown said, well, if you're going to get ordained, you might as well get baptized. And so it was you know, much later in the process. Um, so it's, it, the, these are a, a means to bring us back. Now, it's possible that you don't have access to these. And life goes on. You say, why do they work? Let's skim through this quickly. We've got about 10 minutes here. Um, so C, look, he says they don't work because it, it's simply we're copying Christ or thinking about Christ. So you don't go to communion and you say, let me think about Christ. Uh, that would be, it's just a memorial. There's, there's going to be more here. They mean, D, that Christ is actually opening through them. That the whole mass of Christians are the physical organism through which Christ acts. And so somehow in doing these, spiritually, you're opening yourself up some more. I don't know how that works. I wouldn't know how to define it or even describe it. I think I, I, I would think the idea that if you say the like communion is just we're just remembering what he's done. It's more than that. We are remembering. Do this in remembrance of me. But it's not just remembering that event. It's recalling the life that we have in Christ and somehow re, re engaging that if you've been married. You understand how relationships ebb and flow. And I'd say even as a Christian, they ebb and flow. You say, well, that's a bad thing. No, that's just a thing. I think it's how life works. And that, that, that what these do is they, 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 they give you the opportunity to, to, to slow down and simply say, this matters. Uh, let me re-engage. Why do you have wedding anniversaries? Why do we do birthdays? It was my kid's birthday yesterday. Why do we do these things? It's a celebration. It's a reminding. It's Mother's Day. And my guess is children call parents generally on this day. A lot of parents probably don't get calls from their kids. That says something about the relationship. As kids call their moms, there's, there's a reunited mom we haven't talked in months. Boy, is it good to talk to you. It's not just remembering. Thank you for being my, what's the word Kent taught us today? Birthing, Birth, birthing, person. birthing person. Yeah, you, you're no longer a mother. You're a birthing person. So no longer are you my birthing person, but you know it, it's the connection. So Christ is operating through them. You realize what Christ does in this world? He uses us. 
And this then is our time to get with him and sit down and have dinner with him. Um, let's see. Yeah, it's good. E, this new life is spread not only by purely mental acts like belief, but by bodily acts like baptism. It's using, and Holy Communion, it's using all of you. So when you go to a concert, you just don't sing. You'll watch people other than me dance. You go, you go watch a sporting event. You just don't sit there and go, oh, they're playing well. You're into it. It's all of you. Uh, you, you know, you, you watch a movie and you're engaged. It's, it's more than just the mental. So we don't sit in church and just hear ideas. It, it needs to be the engagement of all of our emotions. That's why I'm waiting for somebody to run up down the middle of the hall. I have a friend who has a church, and what they do is halfway through, I'm not advocating this, they'll, they'll run through with flags. <laughs> and then periodically when people sing, they decide it's time to lie down on the floor. So you have people on the floor doing it. But what they're attempting to do, whether you accept it or not, is move beyond the, the, the simply intellectual to the, to the emotive. Uh, it, for me, it's a little uncomfortable, but they didn't ask me. I only kicked one of them. Um, so it's not F. It's not merely spreading an idea. It's this biological spread. That's cool. Um, so, so God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature, G. That's why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. Now, he puts new life into us apart from those. Remember, so, the, so what you're doing is you're just celebrating what God's already doing. It's more than remembering. It's not like if you don't have communion, you're going to be a second-class citizen. But, but what you're doing is celebrating what he's doing, and it gives you something tangible. So when we go to Warrior Week, we give kids these little things. This isn't one. I gave mine away, but something like this so they can wear it. So it remind, in fact, what we did is, is a couple years, we put all the names of all the kids and, and teachers, and then they'd just come and randomly pick one out. And during that year, you would wear it. Every time you'd look at it, you'd be reminded of that person and to pray for them. And so it, it's, it's, it's a physical reminder. that It's right here. You know, it, I can feel it. Bread and, 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 and the wine or our goofy little whatever those things are that we now have in the covid um, we may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. That's really good. All right, let's, so let's see if there's... And we're going to do these two objections real quickly, and then we'll be done here. Guys, thank you. This has been a lot of fun, but let's just... So is it not frightfully unfair that this new life should be confined to people who have heard of Christ and been able to believe in Him? I think you already know the answer to that. And um, here's his answer. We do know that no one can be saved except through Christ. That's B. C, but we don't know who God's working in. You realize all over the world, think of all the millions of people. I was watching videos this morning, 31 videos of dogs that would make you like dogs or something. Now you don't have to, you know, I, I watched three of them. But as I was watching them and I was watching these dogs react to their owners in the way that my dogs re react to me, I thought there are dogs all over this country who, who, who have good relationships with their owners. There is a God of the universe who is working all over this world, moving in people's hearts. It's so much bigger than us. And Lewis says, we don't know who he's working through. Our part, if you want to help those outside, you must add your own little cell to the body of Christ who alone can help them. That's Mary's prayer. That's our working at the homeless shelter. Uh, last week we did something with um, uh, a, a pet adoption place. Uh, anything where you're, you're serving humanity. This is where we, we get out beyond, I guess, the walls and we say, you know, we're going to do our little bit, but only our little bit. We can't do everything, but we can do our little bit. Now, here, here, here's, here's what Paul would say in Romans. People already know God. Uh, Romans 1 and 2 makes the case that because of this inward conscious, natural revelation that we've talked about, that, that there's awareness of a God. You'll never find any, any civilization that's starting that, that is not theistic in some way. We talked about the atheism being a, a, a much further development after sort of we thought we got smart. So you've got this internal God, uh, awareness of who God is, and then you've got creation that even makes, it makes no sense unless you look at it and say, man, there's something bigger than me. And, and so what it says in Romans is God is moving in hearts even there, and that's the revelation he's given them. And some people will respond even to that. So otherwise, everyone who was born before Jesus, just out of luck. And so that there are people who are saved in Jesus. He says this, we know that no man can be saved except through Christ. Christ died in time and space. People were born before him, but God who works outside of time was even moving in their hearts based on the death and resurrection of Jesus before he was even a man. And so we don't know what he's doing, except we do know how gracious he is. 
You want to know how gracious God is? Look around and see how many different types of flowers there are. In my back area, there are at least eight different types of weeds that flower. And I'm amazed because I think I'm the only one who's seen these. And I think, thank you, Lord, you made these for me. Now that's, you know, because I think the world revolves around me because narcissism works that way. But, but you know, look, look, just look how, how gracious he is in that little world. Here's the second objection. Why is God landing in this enemy-occupied world in disguise and starting a sort of secret society? Why is he not landing in force, invading it? He will land in force. Here's the short answer. But when he lands in force, it's a little late. And so he comes now drawing people to himself. He comes in disguise, slowly and steadily bringing people to himself. Um, and then I say, I think in that way, he has come in force. Guess who's the king of the universe? It's Jesus. Read Romans 1. It's a, it's a diatribe against Caesar being in charge. It's really Jesus is king. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ. And he has come in force. He just comes quietly. Um, you, you walk tall or carry a big stick. Um, he walks tall. Doesn't need a big stick because you're not going to mess with him. He's the, uh, he's the teacher that walks in the room, not my class, and everybody gets quiet. Um, and Jesus is there. Why is he delaying? He wants to give us the chance of joining his side freely. That's one side of it. Read. I think scripture teaches that he's being patient until all whom the Father has chosen respond. Look at what First Peter, Second Peter. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Isn't it nice, those of you who are praying for your children, that he hasn't come? Why? Because he's, he's drawing them in. Well, can't he hurry up? Nah, man. I used to make these cookies when I was a kid, chocolate oatmeal fudges, and you had to boil them. And you had to boil them a certain amount of time. If it didn't go far enough, they would like caramelize. And if you didn't boil them long enough, when you were done, you were always disappointed because you just hadn't been patient enough. Um, and so my mom taught me, because, you know, teach, give a man a fish, he eats for a day. You know the rest? Yeah, yeah I was a fisherman. Little did I know I'd be my own cook for all these years. <laughs> when that happens, Jesus coming in force, it's the end of the world. When the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. Isn't that bizarre? Someday the play will be over. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I thought you were going to say something. Listen, it will be, think about this. If this doesn't break your heart, rend your heart in two, it'll be something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others. See, I want to be a universalist so that everyone comes to know Jesus. If I were God, that would be the case. But thankfully, I'm not God. How's that work? I don't know. None of us will have any choice left. It'll be either irresistible love or irresistible horror. Now that leads you to prayer, doesn't it? Humility. Father, do whatever you can for those I know and love. You ever just see someone like Pilar where you're just, your heart goes out to them? See, that's where I think you walk and you just pray for people. And you just, as I drive now and there's some turkey that pulls in front of me, you know, after I curse them out, I'm starting to try to pray for them. Um, it'll be too late to choose your side. Wow. Here's an interesting one. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen. Now that's a scary thought. And remember Jesus saying, get away from me, I never knew you. So now, today, notice his, his audience. He's talking to mostly non-Christians. This moment, it's our chance to choose the right side. God is holding back to give us that chance. It will not last forever. We must take it or leave it. Did C.S. Lewis know Jesus clearly? He understood what was at stake. We are not playing games. Uh, I am a missionary at Westminster. And until God gives me leave, I can't, I can't go anywhere else. Why? Because I've got how many pagans get, walk through my door and willingly or unwillingly hear about Jesus. That's pretty cool. And you guys have a life where people in your circle are thinking these things. You just may not know it. And they're watching you. And you're their, you, you are the avenue to introduce them to Jesus. Not that Jesus can't work apart from you, but he's choosing to use you. And so we do pray, and we do reach out, and we do ask for opportunities. And, and Timothy makes it clear. Paul to Timothy says, just be prepared for, to, you know, to talk about the hope that's in you. God's going to bring people. You'll have more than you know what to do with. All right. got to quit. And by the way, and by the way a birthing person? 
a birthing person. Is a midwife. Is a midwife. <laughs> quote. Quote. As Mary Crable, in case you couldn't hear the rumble. All right, let's pray, guys. Thank you so much. Lord, that was good. Uh, we have theologians in this room. And we're just trying to make sense of this. Theology is the most practical thing we can do because it, make, it helps us, it gives a framework for how we live, how we deal with our children, how we deal with temptation, how we deal with anger and frustration, uh, how we deal with our own pride, uh, what we do when we're sitting in a service and it's, and it's time to, to take the elements of communion. So thank you for these guys and the way your spirit is clearly uh, moving in them that they might think more like Jesus. Pray the same for me. Make us childlike more and more that we might laugh as others laugh. Not at them, but with them. Childlike so that we might cry as others cry. Not at them, but with them. Uh, help us to see, as I say, the dogs, but really the little people. Those that others just don't recognize because they too are calling out for help and they need Jesus. Uh, for each person in here, you know their stories. I think of Joanne today, especially as she's with her kids. May this be an incredible day. And if any of those guys don't know Jesus, maybe today. Your timing is perfect. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <sighs> now I feel okay about playing poker. I quit before midnight, though, so I make sure I don't play poker on Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> poker, poker, poker. Yes.